So this, uh, this session is Docker and OTP, friends or foes. Uh, my name is Daniel Azuma. Uh, we'll get started. Um, great. Uh, a few years ago, uh, back in 2015, I think it was, uh, I got together with a few friends of mine. Uh, we were from a local meetup group. Uh, it was a Ruby meetup. And we were, were learning Elixir together. And so we did a little project uh, as part of our just kind of uh, getting some practice with Elixir. Uh, I wanted to show you uh, some of that really quick. Um, so let me uh, get out of here. And let's see if I can remember how to do this. OK. Uh, this project is actually a uh, little uh, game. Uh, as you can see, it's a tank game. Uh, it's, it's online multiplayer. I've got uh, one of my uh, colleagues on, online with me. And you run around this maze uh, and shoot down your opponent's tanks. Uh, so we're going to come down here and try to kill each other here. And we both died. Um, but as you can see, it's uh, uh, online, it's multiplayer, and it's real time. Uh, and so we, we wrote this in Elixir. And uh, here we go. So when we wrote this, uh, we kind of made a few design decisions. I'm going to set this back here. Uh, we made a few design decisions. And uh, one of the key decisions we made was the game state uh, and the logic was going to be implemented server side. Uh, so we implemented it all in Elixir. And the client side JavaScript uh, that you see here is just kind of a thin uh, view uh, on that. So architecturally, what that looks like is we, we have client-side JavaScript running here on the browser. Uh, and then it receives updates over a WebSocket. And then all the game logic is implemented on the server. Uh, so that means each game uh, is managed by a gen server that uh, keeps the state of the game. Uh, and then there are a few other processes involved that help run the game, uh, perform kind of the simple physics calculations and so forth. Uh, and then all these are managed by a supervisor. So each game has a supervisor and uh, a few processes. Uh, and then we put Phoenix in the middle of that. Uh, so we have a Phoenix app uh, that has uh, channel processes that manage those WebSocket connections. And uh, those go through a load balancer. And then that, uh, that channel exchanges messages with the game. Uh, so kind of the general architecture of this app. Uh, Pretty straightforward, probably a typical Phoenix app, uh, except for maybe one thing that you might notice. Uh, there's no database here. There's no database. This is a stateful application. Uh, the game state uh, is kept in the process, in the application, in the in gen server state. Uh, and so because we don't have a database, uh, we avoid a bunch of things. We avoid the database round trips. We avoid the serialization, deserialization. We avoid that latency. Uh, and that simplified our code quite a bit, uh, as well as uh, uh, enabled us to get a reasonable performance out of the app. So a stateful application. Uh, OTP is actually quite well equipped to support this kind of architecture. And I think there's another talk on this, uh, this kind of thing later this afternoon that I'm looking forward to. Uh, so, we wrote this app. Uh, then a few weeks later, we decided that we wanted to demo it at our meetup. So uh, part of that demo was we were going to explain uh, how we built the app. And then we were going to invite uh, everyone to kind of jump onto the app and play, play the game with us. So we had to face that perennial Elixir problem, which is how do you deploy uh, an Elixir app? How do you deploy? This was 2015. Uh, so Elixir uh, 1.0 was out. Uh, Phoenix 1.0 was not quite out yet. Uh, but it was fairly early days. Um, and looking back, uh, I actually kind of find it interesting to note that uh, around, it was around the same time that uh, Elixir uh, was kind of just coming out into the spotlight. So 1.0 was coming out 2014, 2015. Uh, Around the same time, another really interesting set of technologies uh, was coming out. Uh, and that was Docker. Docker containers, uh, and then later Kubernetes, container orchestration, and kind of a whole ecosystem around that. 
Well, nowadays, fast forward three years later, uh, containers are pretty much the de facto standard technology that people use for deploying online applications, right? Uh, and I think for good reason. It solves a lot of problems for you. Uh, you know, packaging, versioning, updates, scaling, and especially interoperability. Uh, so it's a powerful set of tools. So, you know, 2015, I think Kubernetes was around 1.0-ish at the time. Uh, I, decided, I decided, hey, let's use this hot new thing and deploy our app so that uh, our, our meetup group can use it. So I, uh, I fired up uh, uh, releases. I, I created a release, wrapped it in the Docker image, and then I spun up Kubernetes and ran it in Kubernetes, and everything was awesome. Briefly, see, the next thing that uh, I had to do was uh, uh, we, we had a bug in our code, and I needed to fix that and deploy an update. Now, to deploy a, uh, an update to an app running, uh, say, in Kubernetes, uh, one thing that you might uh, expect it to do uh, is first it might spin up a new container with the updated code, and then, of course, you'll terminate the old container. So kind of your typical zero downtime deployment. Uh, except that in our case, this wasn't zero downtime because we have games running in their own processes. Uh, the game state is kept in the process state, all the, where all the locations of everything, all the objects were and what they're doing. And so when the container goes away, the process goes away, and so our game goes away, and that's not the experience that we want. So again, this was three years ago. Uh, we kind of sidestepped this problem for, for that demo that day. Uh, we didn't do any updates uh, during that demo. But uh, in the real world, of course, you need to deploy updates, right? Of course you need to scale your app up and down. Uh, and so, of course, you're going to have containers coming and going. And then all of a sudden, this container business doesn't seem to be working so well for us, right? And that's an issue that we've been dealing with uh, quite a bit in our community for the past few years. Uh, and it's an important one because uh, really, containers uh, are an industry standard now. Uh, it's how the builds and deployments are done. It's how our cloud platforms operate. Uh, so this is an important issue. How do we, uh, how do we work well uh, in uh, an environment that has Docker, that has containers, and we want to use these technologies? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, now, I, I don't have the answer for you here. Uh, I don't have a silver bullet uh, for you. Uh, what I do have uh, is potentially some useful ways of thinking about this problem, and then some ideas, some tools that we could use that might be helpful, uh, and some directions that might, we might uh, consider going as a community uh, as we think about containers, as we think about the cloud. So first, just a little bit of background. Uh, again, uh, this is me. My name is Daniel Azuma. Uh, I'm a local here. I live just a few minutes north uh, in the town of Kirkland, uh, which uh, name some of you might recognize uh, is associated with Costco. Uh, Costco's headquarters is actually not too far from here, and I think it's in Issaquah. Um, I don't work at Costco. Uh, I work at a small company you probably haven't heard of. Actually, I actually have a pretty good role here. Um, I, I'm part of Google Cloud, uh, the cloud platform organization. Uh, and I serve uh, as kind of an internal uh, uh, expert uh, uh, consultant uh, on Ruby uh, and on Elixir, uh, my favorite languages. And so uh, really, I, I, I really enjoy it. My, basically, my job is to make the cloud better for uh, you know, these languages, for people like you. Uh, but as many of you know, uh, Google uh, has been in containers uh, for a long time. It's really heavily invested in containers. Uh, in fact, we've been using them uh, for a long time, long before Docker was even a thing. Uh, containers were really a key part of Google's infrastructure strategy. Uh, and so as a Googler, uh, I'm, uh, I, I really understand how important this technology is. Uh, but at the same time, as an Elixir developer, uh, I feel this, this friction. Uh, I feel this, this sense that uh, containers don't seem to be working that well for us. 
there's something, yeah, there, there's, there's something that, I, that needs to be fixed here. And so like, take our tank game, for example. Uh, as a normal part of operations, uh, I need to be able to terminate containers. Right? I need to be able to take containers up and down. Uh, that's how we do our deployments. That's how we do our scaling. That's how we manage our infrastructure. But I also want long-running processes. I want stateful processes because that's how my app is designed. I don't want to compromise my app's architecture just so I can deploy to the cloud. So there seems to be a conflict here, some kind of a technical uh, incompatibility, maybe. Or here's another example. Uh, this is something that I hear quite a bit from uh, Erlang developers, actually. Uh, so what if I wanted to really optimize uh, my usage of resources? So I, I want to squeeze every last megabyte and every last CPU cycle uh, out of my hardware uh, so that you know, I can reach those two million concurrent connections, right? Now, if I'm running in a container, maybe I'm afraid there might be some overhead that I have to deal with. Or if I'm running in the cloud, you know, maybe I'll, I'll encounter some resource contention or something. There's, there's, there seems to be some uncertainty here, some conflict. And in this case in particular, uh, it seems to be more than technical. Uh, there's almost like a clash of values here, uh, a like a clash of cultures even. Uh, there's differing opinions uh, about the importance of something, in this case, resource efficiency. Is it, is it important to squeeze every last resource out of that hardware, or is it okay to just to spin up additional hardware? It's kind of a clash of values here. So how do we address these conflicts? How do we address these? Well, in case you uh, can't tell, uh, I'm Asian American. Um, I'm actually from California originally, but a lot of my relatives and a lot of my friends uh, were immigrants into this country. Uh, this is an old photo of uh, some of my, my older relatives, uh, including my great-grandparents, who were uh, immigrants into the US from Japan uh, 100 or so years ago, I think just, just under 100 years ago. Uh, some of you today here uh, might be immigrants or visitors uh, in this country. Uh, and many of the stories that I hear from some of my older relatives uh, who are immigrants uh, center around this clash of cultures that they experience. Uh, you, so you, you have your culture of origin, uh, and then you have a dominant culture that you're moving into. Uh, and there might be differences. And so as these cultures meet, uh, different people will respond to that in different ways. Uh, for example, some people will choose to kind of hold on to that culture of origin, the culture where they came from. Uh, so they might say, you know, uh, I, I, I'm from Japan. Uh, I want to continue to be Japanese because that's what I'm comfortable with. That's, that's who I am. Uh, and so I'm only going to uh, accept or adopt those pieces of the Western culture that I've moved into, uh, only those pieces that fit into kind of a Japanese framework. So some people uh, just, they, they, they choose to hold on to that culture of origin. And that's an approach that some of us take with our technology. Right? We might say, you know what, this app that I'm writing, this is, this is going to be an OTP app, because that's what I'm familiar with. Uh, I'm familiar with OTP, Elixir, the Elixir way of doing things. And so I'm going to make design decisions based on those principles. And I'll adopt only a little bit of cloud, only a little bit of containers, only the little bit that fits into that paradigm. So maybe, for example, I'll, I'll deploy into some VMs, uh, but I won't use containers. Uh, I won't use the cloud services, uh, because you know, my app is an OTP app. Uh, and you know, OTP is my operating system. I can do everything in OTP, uh, and that's the way things are going to be. So this approach, and a lot of us do this, uh, is you know, it, it's easy because it's familiar. You know, we're, we're, uh, we get to keep our familiar culture, our familiar techniques that we learn about here at ElixirConf. Um, but at the same time, there's a risk. And the risk is that we could become isolated from the surrounding culture. Uh, so if the rest of the industry is on containers, uh, and that's happening fast, uh, it means that we're less able to engage with them. As a community, we risk becoming isolated 
from the rest of the, the industry, or worse, maybe even irrelevant. Or another option is we might go the other direction. So instead of just embracing our culture of origin, we decide to embrace the dominant culture that we're moving into. Uh, so we might leave behind that culture of origin, embrace the dominant culture. So we might say, this is a cloud native app that I'm going to build. Uh, I'm going to build it as a set of stateless workers, uh, design it to fit in the cloud paradigm so I can deploy it to serverless. Uh, and I'm only going to use a little bit of OTP, just the part that fits into the cloud paradigm. And you know what? If we're honest with ourselves, uh, a lot of our Phoenix apps actually kind of look like this, right? We write our app in Elixir, but really the application design looks pretty much the same as if we had written it in, say, Ruby on Rails. So we end up not really utilizing those concurrent processes, the message passing, the supervised services uh, like we could. And why? So that we can fit in. So we can fit into that cloud paradigm. And it works. You know, we can build Phoenix apps like this. But then, of course, we've lost some of the value uh, that we could have gotten from OTP, some of the value that Elixir provides us, some of the uniqueness that we have in our community. So some of us choose to focus on our culture of origin, and others of us choose to just to adopt, uh, uh, adopt the dominant culture. But there are also others who might choose to take another way, uh, whether you're doing, doing this in tech or whether you're moving in, whether you're an immigrant moving into a new culture, you might choose to take another way. Uh, and that way is to find ways to take the good stuff from both sides, from both cultures, and combine them uh, into something new. So instead of being Japanese or being American, right, instead of being an OTP developer or a, a cloud native developer, what if we could take some of the strengths and capabilities of both sides, and using our creativity, combine them, put them together, and create something new. Now, this is not necessarily an easy task. Uh, we might have to solve some challenges. We might make some mistakes along the way or even end up with something uh, bizarre. But it also opens the door for some new possibilities. And so let's explore a little bit what this might look like. You know, how could we take the good parts of OTP and the good parts of the container world and combine them? And to do that, we're going to return to our tank game here. So remember, this is an OTP app, right? We have supervisors, we have processes, we have messages. But this is also a cloud-based app. We wanted to deploy this to the cloud so that we can deploy often, so that we can have updates, so we can scale, so we can use all these cloud tools that the industry is using around us. Now, how do we keep the good stuff from both worlds? Well, to do so, we do have to solve a few problems. So let's think about those problems. First, clusters. So for our OTP app, we have Lots of processes. So we have Phoenix channels, and we have those game processes. And they, and they need to communicate with each other. So if we're running on, say, multiple nodes, if, we, uh, if, if we've deployed onto uh, a number of containers, those need to be connected. Those need to be able to communicate. So we need an Erlang cluster connecting all of those. And more than that, we need to maintain that Erlang cluster so that as we, as we deploy to new nodes or we turn down others, that that Erlang cluster gets updated. This is where we can reach for a library uh, that can help us. Uh, so the one that I chose to use for this, uh, this project uh, is libcluster. Uh, this is written by uh, Paul Schoenfelder, who also wrote Distillery and a bunch of other tools that you're probably familiar with. Uh, libcluster is a library that dynamically builds and maintains an Erlang cluster based on some kind of input. Uh, in this case, uh, it could be the Kubernetes API. So you might uh, look like this somehow. Uh, we might add libcluster to our Phoenix app, uh, and then we configure it to talk to Kubernetes, and then we start it running. And so as this process goes, uh, it's, it pulls the, the Kubernetes API, and then it keeps our Erlang cluster uh, up to date as Kubernetes uh, takes nodes up and down. 
Okay? So, so far so good. You know, that one is relatively easy. Uh, let's take a look at another problem. What happens when a container goes down? Okay? What happens when a node goes away? So we have these long-running processes. What do we do with them? Our app has two kinds of long-running processes. So we have those game processes, uh, and we also have Phoenix channels. Uh, those, run, uh, those run as long as the, the WebSocket is open. So let's consider channels first, because uh, this turns out to be a little bit easier. Uh, so suppose a channel goes away. Uh, Phoenix actually handles most of this for us. So if that channel disappears, the WebSocket uh, gets disconnected, and the Phoenix's client-side library is going to detect that. Uh, it says, aha, something happened to my WebSocket. I need to do something. Uh, and it will try to reconnect. Uh, and it does that uh, repeatedly on a back off. Uh, so it does that for you. Load Balancer will you know, reconnect uh, your app to a node that's still running. Uh, then Phoenix will reconstitute your channel, and we're back in business. Right? So Phoenix handles most of that for you. Few details here. Uh, if your channel has state, so say you have some assigns uh, in your in your channel uh, and that you want to uh, preserve, uh, one way to do that is to actually push that information back out to the client. Uh, so you can uh, you can send that uh, back to JavaScript, uh, and then uh, you can configure uh, the channel object on the JavaScript side uh, to send that information back down to the server when it does a rejoin. So. But this is basically all uh, features of Phoenix. So Phoenix will handle uh, a lot of this for you, for channels. So those are straightforward. Let's talk about gen servers. Let's talk about game processes. Because this is a little bit more tricky. So what happens when this bottom node goes away? We need to rescue that game somehow. We have a process that's dying, and we need to resurrect it. Right? Well, we do have an OTP construct that does that sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Restarts a process when it goes down, right? It's a supervisor. So our situation is a little bit different. We kind of want something that's like a supervisor, uh, but in our case, the entire node is going down. It's not just the process. Uh, so the entire node, along with the whole, the, the whole process tree, uh, and so we want that process and all the processes, in fact, to restart on a different node. So what we actually want here is uh, a distributed supervisor, some kind of a distributed supervisor. And there are a few of those uh, out there. The one that I chose for this project uh, is called Horde. Uh, Horde is a relatively new library. It's been out for just a few months. Uh, and uh, here's how it works. Um, it provides a special kind of supervisor. Uh, you start one of these in each node, uh, start a horde supervisor in each node that you have, and then you connect them. Uh, you connect them into a cluster of supervisors. Now, behind the scenes, this actually uses a CRDT. Uh, that's a conflict-free replicated data type. Uh, and it uses that to share state uh, between those clustered nodes. So these two supervisors running on different nodes actually behave like a single supervisor with a single set of state. Uh, and it just happens to be spread out uh, over multiple nodes. And so when we want to start a game process, we call start child on this distributed supervisor. And then that chooses a node and starts the process. Uh, and then if that node goes down and the process terminates, our supervisor will just simply choose another node, that's one that's still alive, and restart the process. OK? So great. So far, so good. We have the game process getting restarted from the beginning, which is probably not quite what we want either. Right? If I'm playing a game and then something happens, my game restarts, and now you know, I've, I've racked up uh, some nice you know, stats of 15 kills, and now that's all gone back to zero. We want the game actually to continue where it left off. Right? We want to preserve the process state not just restart the process. And supervisors by themselves, uh, unfortunately, don't do this for us. If you want state saved, uh, you have to do so explicitly. Uh, for example, one way you can do this is spin up an agent. Uh, so you spin up a separate agent, uh, stash your state in that agent, and then when the process restarts, you can just pull the state from that agent and continue on. Well, in our case, 
the process is being restarted on a different node. So we need a kind of agent that spans nodes. We need a distributed agent. And it turns out that's basically what a CRDT is, or what a CRDT can give us, right? Uh, a piece of data that's shared, that's replicated uh, across multiple nodes. So for a tanking app, uh, I use the CRDT to save process state. And here's what that looks like. Uh, I create a process, a CRDT process, which I call handoff. Uh, it gets started in each node, uh, and then we connect them. Uh, now, when Kubernetes shuts down a node, uh, generally this is what happens. Uh, it tries to do a graceful shutdown. Uh, so it's, first it sends a SIG term, uh, and then the beam will catch that, OTP will catch that signal, and it uses that to do an orderly shutdown of all your applications. Uh, and so you have the opportunity uh, you know, for, for each of your processes to do some cleanup uh, by implementing the terminate callback in GenServer. Uh, so when we receive a SIG term indicating that a node is about to go down, we implement terminate, uh, and we take that opportunity to take the state of the game, and we stash it over into that uh, handoff CRDT. Uh, and again, it's a CRDT, so that state data gets propagated out to the other nodes. Then the process shuts down, and our distributed supervisor restarts it on another node. And then finally, we can read the state from the handoff and continue the game from that point. All right? So this is awesome so far. We have games that are restarting on new nodes and migrating their state so that the game can continue where it left off. So we're almost done. Uh, we have one more problem to solve, uh, and that is communication. We need to make sure that when a game process moves from one node to another, uh, it can still be located and communicated with. Now again, OTP gives us a kind of a general solution for persistent names for processes, right? And what's that called? It's a registry, right? So once again, for our case, we need a distributed registry. This is now, there is a uh, kind of a global distributed registry that Erlang provides us. Um, uh, it relies, as I understand it, on locking the world. Um, uh, so it might not scale too well when, when, you, uh, when it gets large. Uh, Horde actually provides a lock-free implementation of a distributed registry. And again, it uses a CRDT. Um, so again, what does that look like? Again, we create uh, and connect up this registry, so now it behaves like a single registry with a single state. Uh, and as each game process comes up, it adds itself to the registry, and then channels can look up the game processes regardless of what node they're running on. And then, of course, when the process migrates to a new node, it just re-registers itself and things still work. Okay. So again, to recap, we, have an, we now have an app that uses OTP, it uses long-running processes, and it works with container deployments. It works if that container that we're running in disappears and gets restarted. So and to do so, we had to solve these four problems. Right? We've, first of all, we connected uh, the nodes into an Erlang cluster, and we used, that, used a lib cluster for that. Uh, second, we restarted processes on new nodes, uh, and we used a distributed supervisor, Horde supervisor, for that. Uh, third, we migrated process state, and we used a CRDT for that. Uh, and fourth, we maintained communication using a distributed registry, and again, we used Horde for that. Okay? So, this sounds great on paper, sounds great on keynote slides. Does it actually work? Well, let's try it out. Uh, I have a little demo here. Uh, as you saw, I'm running a server. I'm running this, uh, this application. Uh, and we'll have a few live games running. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a live code update uh, while those games are running. Uh, and actually, you know what? Let's have some fun. Uh, if you have a laptop, uh, for those of you who are like doing email on your laptop while you're watching my talk, here's something constructive that you can do. I want you to. I want to invite you to help me out by connecting to the game. So here's, here's the URL. Uh, go ahead and connect up. Uh, you can join an existing game uh, or start your own. Uh, I'm not sure how well the conference Wi-Fi will hold up uh, to this. There's actually quite a bit of bandwidth uh, going through these web sockets, but we'll see. Uh, we'll, we'll just see how it works. 
Um, so I'll leave that URL up there uh, so uh, those of you with laptops can get connected up. Uh, here's a quick overview of what we can expect to see. So I'm currently running the game on two containers. So I've got two containers. Uh, it's running version one uh, of my build. Uh, I'm going to tell Kubernetes to update the game. I've already built a version two. Um, and so first, what, what Kubernetes is going to do is it's going to terminate one of the old containers. Um, so anything running on that old container uh, will have to move to that remaining container. Right? Next, Kubernetes will start two new containers running the new code. Okay? And those will take uh, a few seconds to, to spin up. Uh, and then when those are ready, the remaining old container will terminate. Uh, and that will cause, again, anything running on that old container to migrate to one of those two new containers. So overall, we'll expect to see at least one, maybe two uh, process moves, uh, depending on where your processes are running. Uh, so let's give this a try. Uh, I'm going to switch out of Keynote and let's see. See if I can mirror my displays. There we go. Uh, so we've got a few people online on this game. Uh, if, you're, if you're online, can you raise your hand? I want to see how many people we have. Oh, we have quite a few. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, actually, let, let, me, uh, let me take a really quick stat here. Uh, that's a lot of players, 281. That doesn't sound right. I think I might have screwed up my stats count here. But anyway, we have 18 games running. Uh, and we have quite a few. So let's, uh, uh, you guys aren't like creating more, more than one player. Uh, you know, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna crash my game. Um, <laughs> but we'll see how this works. And so uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, join as well. Uh, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to tell Kubernetes to update. Uh, now, what, you can, what you'll see is um, uh, I have a couple of, actually let me uh, go ahead and uh, expand this out a little bit so you can see better. Uh, I have a couple of indicators here. This is the node ID uh, of the uh, Phoenix channel that I'm running, that I'm connected to. Uh, this is the node ID of the game process that, I'm, that my game is running on. Uh, and as you can see, they're, they're different. So I'm running on two nodes, and they're running on two different processes, uh, uh, two, different, uh, two different nodes. Um, this is the, uh, the build uh, that I'm running. And so as I update, uh, as I do the updates, you'll see these change. You'll see the, these, the, the channel move, uh, the game move, and then eventually uh, the, uh, the version of the build that I'm talking to move. Uh, so where did my thing go here? So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, do this update, uh, and we'll see what happens, cross fingers. Um, so again, first, the first thing we should expect to see is, uh, yep, there it is. So that's the, the game actually moved to the same node because we're down to one node. Uh, so now that the version two nodes are spinning up, uh, and there's a Donald Trump game, uh, someone called named Donald Trump here. Uh, and then there we go. So the, the game, uh, the, the, the Phoenix channel moves, the game moved, and now we're running on version two, and the game's still running, okay? So there we go. Let's, uh, so let me quickly switch back here. All right, so let's see. We have just a few minutes. So what have we learned from this exercise? Um, apart from how fun live demos are, uh, we've seen that long-running processes can coexist with containers in a cloud environment. Uh, we, we simply used tools uh, to help us migrate processes, right, when those containers went down. And the way we did this is not the only way. Uh, I used Horde, uh, I used the CRDT library that was uh, written by the same uh, author uh, that Horde, uh, that, who wrote Horde. Uh, there are other libraries. Um, uh, there's Swarm, which is another library that lets you perform process migration. Uh, there's also LASP, uh, it's a collection of libraries, uh, things like distributed registries, uh, CRDTs, and so forth, uh, that can be used to build systems like this. So uh, there are a number of tools uh, coming up uh, in our community and more on the way. Uh, who's here, who here has heard of Jigelixer? 
Okay, just a few, actually. I would have expected more. Uh, there, this is an Elixir-centric hosting service, kind of like a Heroku that's uh, optimized for Elixir type of uh, uh, use cases. Uh, and they, they run on Kubernetes, uh, and they, they do another solution. They, they do zero downtime deployments, uh, uh, but they do so using OTP's uh, hot upgrade, hot code upgrade. Uh, and they're running on Kubernetes, so they do that in containers, right? You can do that. No one said your containers have to be immutable or anything. You know, they did have to be creative to uh, do that, so they're actually, as I understand it, uh, mounting your app uh, into, the con into the container as it's running so that they can uh, update it uh, uh, in a volume rather than uh, in the container's uh, file system itself. So there are trade-offs, but it works. It works well for them. And it might work well for your app as well. So again, finding creative ways to integrate the OTP way with the cloud way and create something new. So, Docker and OTP. Are they friends or are they foes? My answer to that would be, they are really whatever we let them be. We can let them be foes by choosing one over the other, by saying we're gonna adopt one uh, and only just kind of fit a little bit of the other in if, if it does. And if we do that, we lose some of the richness and some of the capabilities uh, that we might have. Or worse, we might isolate ourselves uh, from what's going on in our industry. Or we can let Docker and OTP be friends by finding creative ways to integrate them. And in doing so is the potential to create something new and exciting. We, we can have stateful distributed apps in the cloud. And I've shown you one example of what that could look like. Just one. It's not the only way. And I'm sure you all can come up with others because really this is, this is the Elixir community. This is our community, right? We, we have people here who come from all these uh, different, different backgrounds, Erlangers and Rubius. We have computer science researchers and, and uh, hobbyists in the same room. Right? We have web developers and embedded developers working off the same technology stack. We are a multicultural community. This is in our DNA to be able to do this, to be able to take different uh, ideas, different technologies, and find creative ways to integrate them. Right? So what do you say, friends? Thank you for coming. If you're interested, uh, if you're interested in more, uh, I've uh, collected a bunch of things on this URL. So this is the thing to snapshot. Uh, if it comes back, there we go. Um, uh, so I'll have uh, these slides uh, and the video when it comes out linked to here, as well as uh, related articles and links to the tank source code and all the, the libraries that we talked about. Uh, I'll, I'll add more to it uh, over, the, over the next few days. Uh, so if you want to learn more, uh, there, and also I'll leave the game up for the rest of the day, uh, so feel free to have fun with it. Please don't play it in the middle of someone else's talk, um, but otherwise, during the breaks, uh, it'll, it'll be there for the rest of the day, so have fun. Uh, do we have any time for, okay, I'm, I'm told we don't have time for questions. Apologize, I will be out there in the hallway uh, if anyone wants to uh, uh, talk more about this sort of thing. Thank you for coming, have a great day everyone.